When we moved to Montgomery in 1955, it really was 54 September, the conditions of segregation uh, and uh, the humiliation that attended that was very complete. Blacks and whites uh, were completely separated and uh, there had been several incidents where blacks and whites were uh, involved, but blacks attempting to ride the buses and where they had been beaten and dragged off, arrested and so on. And it was uh, the cradle of the Confederacy, really, and uh, no one uh, ever expected any progress to be made in terms of race relations in Montgomery, in terms of it being the original place or the initiator. Uh, we were very happy there, though, in our church situation. Martin was the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And that church had had a history of ministers that had been uh, socially conscious and uh, had been challenging the people to do something about those conditions. Uh, he himself, uh, the pastor just before Martin, or Reverend Johns, had uh, called for a boycott. Uh, he had talked about other conditions uh, that black people suffered under and challenged them to do something about it. So the situation seemed to have been ready to, for a leader. Uh, we did not know that uh, it was uh, the time of an idea when we arrived, but uh, that's exactly what happened. The idea, it was an idea whose time had come. And uh, Martin was there, and I think it, uh, I often say that the man, the moment, uh, and the situation uh, came together. Uh, and uh, the, the Montgomery movement uh, started really when Rosa Parks sat down on that bus, December the 1st, 1955. Well, we were attracted uh, to the South, uh, not necessarily to Montgomery. Uh, initially because we both had a commitment to return to the South and to work in the South to try to bring about some changes in the, the situation of uh, segregation and the, uh, the lack of uh, dignity and uh, respect that uh, among uh, from the black white community uh, toward the black community. Montgomery happened to be the place because Martin was invited to uh, to the pastorate of that church, Dexter Avenue. And when he got the invitation, he said, this is the kind of church that I would like to begin my ministry in because the congregation is an enlightened one and I can preach the way I want to and continue to develop and my ministry, most of the people in Dexter, in the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, church had at least a college education, more than 90%. And many of them were college professors. As a matter of fact, we had about eight or nine PhDs in our congregation. So that the, that the people who were in the church were the kind of people who could appreciate a young PhD uh, just out of seminary. Uh, with a lot of uh, idealism and so on. Uh, Martin's idealism, of course, uh, I think became uh, a combination of uh, idealism and uh, practical uh, reality, I guess, bringing the reality and idealism closer together as he moved over that first year and into what was to come to be the destiny of his life. In Montgomery, the buses uh, were set up so that there was a separation between blacks and whites and there was a section for white people up front and a section for blacks from that point back but it it was something that was movable if there were no whites uh, boarding the buses then the sign for blacks could be moved forward. But if most of the space was taken by whites, then it would move backward. And uh, if it happened to be that there were no seats left, then black people would have to stand. 
uh, if they decide to leave a certain section for whites, then they would have to stand over those empty seats. And it was on that day that Mrs. Parks saw empty seats uh, in the white section, and there were none in the black section, that she sat down. And uh, when she sat down, that is when she was arrested. Well, in some instances, they would have you pay in the front where the driver was, and then you'd walk out of the bus again and go to the back, particularly when your section is in the back. And that happened, uh, I guess, a lot of the time. Uh, blacks would pay their money and then go out of the bus again to the back door and come in the back of the bus and take their seat. Uh, that was, uh, I mean, that kind of obvious uh, humiliation made people feel something was wrong with them, that they couldn't walk through the aisle to the seats, that they had to go outside and come back in where they were least exposed to the whites who were seated on the buses. And um, the way blacks were talked to, I mean, they never were, uh, the way they were looked at even. I mean, there was always, uh, you know, uh, tension and feelings of uh, resentment, it seemed, and hostility, which uh, uh, made you feel less less than, you know, human. And, and the way they were spoken to, the tone of voice and all, uh, very... Uh, degrading. They were called by, not by their names, or, or, or even most times it would be boy, girl, uh, you get back, uh, move over, uh, let that lady pass, you know, anything. I mean, it was just always a reminder that uh, you were less than. And um, I, I remember when uh, and this was true in Montgomery when, when I was in school, uh, we used to walk to school uh, every day, a uh, couple of miles. Even when we lived in the city to, I lived, I was born and reared in the country, but I went to the town of Marion to go to high school. And when the white children would, would meet us, they were going to their schools and we were going in opposite direction. We were going to ours. And uh, they would walk down the sidewalk, and uh, and they and they filled up the sidewalk, and we would have to walk off of the sidewalk in order to let them pass. And if you didn't walk off, you would get knocked off or bumped into. It was that kind of thing, or else you might end up into a fight, and nobody wanted to get into a fight because you you know you could be arrested, and there would be a real serious situation there. Um, so it was always a very uneasy kind of a thing when you saw a group of white youngsters coming down the street uh, and you had you know, a similar group of black youngsters. Segregation was a way of life in the South, and the South we returned to in Montgomery uh, was the South pretty much as we left it. And uh, if you were a person who was educated, lived in a black community, uh, you're living a, where you lived, usually you were segregated from whites. You, And if you worked as a professional, you worked in your own institutions. You didn't have to encounter whites a lot, except when you go downtown and go into the stores. Uh, if you, Most of us had cars, so we didn't have to ride the buses. It was the masses of people, uh, the working people, who had to ride the buses. So one could uh, avoid a lot of the day-to-day -day humiliations uh, if you were uh, so-called middle class, because we had, as I said, separate uh, our separate lives. Uh, we had our own um, community of, of professionals. Martin and I were new to the community, therefore our first uh, concern was to become adjusted in the community, to get to know people, to 
get involved with the church and to really spend time trying to get to know the church people and to for them to be comfortable with us and vice versa. And he was also working for, he was writing his dissertation, trying to finish that up the first year. However, he had presented a program to the church, which they adopted in December of that year. We started there in September and then December, his uh, church program and budget were presented. And he had a very ambitious program uh, we were very excited about the church. We were very excited about what he had proposed. But he had to finish his dissertation. He got his doctorate in uh, June of 1955. So then he was able to spend more time in the church. We had looked forward in that second year to spending a lot of time getting the church program going and all. And as a matter of fact, I discouraged him from taking a position with the NACP as president, which he had been offered. And this was just a few days before, prior to December the 1st, uh, 1955, when he told me he had been invited to serve as president. And I said, well, you know, you need to really get your church program off the ground, and I hope you won't take that now. And he seemed as if he really wanted to. He was considering it. So one night he came home and he said, I've decided to take it. And I said, oh, no. And because by that time he thought, uh, you know, I really believed it. His mother was there because my oldest child was just a few weeks old. And then he said, after he thought we were totally convinced, oh, no, I was just kidding. And it was good that he didn't take it because uh, if he had taken it, it would have been a problem for him uh, later on. Uh, especially as he became the spokesman for the movement. Martin uh, and I were home, I believe, when together, when the phone call came in from E.D. Nixon, who was uh, a leader in the community. Uh, he was the president of NACP and had worked uh, very uh, actively in the community on some of these problems and had called for uh, black people to kind of rise up and do something about it. And he felt that this was an opportunity with these young ministers being in town. Uh, Dr. King uh, was at Dexter and Reverend Abernathy was at First Baptist Church. And they were very good friends and working together. And he called the both of them separately, of course, and suggested that there ought to be a boycott of those buses. And he started giving background on the history of what had happened with black people, the confrontations that had taken place uh, over the years. And uh, I think in the conversation, as I understand it, that they had, uh, they decided from that that they would call together the ministerial uh, group and some leaders. Uh, and that meeting, Martin offered to have that meeting at his church. But it would be the head of the ministerial association, uh, the ministers, the, it was the Black Ministers Alliance, that would uh, uh, spearhead it. And then other leadership was invited in. They had the meeting at Dexter and Things didn't go well the first uh, first night that they had this meeting uh, because somehow the person who was involved in the leadership uh, perhaps was not the best person to chair the meeting. But somehow they got through it and they did make some plans. Uh, the, plans uh, uh, the plans call for a one-day boycott uh, of the buses on December the 5th. And uh, they sent out leaflets all over town and they talked to the ministers to go to their congregations on Sunday and encourage them to stay off the buses for one day uh, to protest uh, this very uh, dreadful situation of Mrs. Parks being arrested and uh, they uh, all were very excited about it but then the thing that made for more excitement was the fact that one of the leaflets uh, was picked up and by a maid and taken to work with her and her uh, mistress or her boss 
found it or took it and read it, and then she called the local newspaper and wanted them to publicize what these blacks were up to so everybody would know about it in the white community. Well, that was really a great way to publicize our cause. And nobody signed it, you know, they didn't know who was doing it. The, the whole idea was not to put anybody's name out there. And they realized that there would be some retaliation. So they were trying to get it started before anyone was identified with it. So <clears throat> the Monday night, December the 5th, there was to be a mass meeting at the Holt Street Baptist Church. And the afternoon uh, of the 5th, there was another meeting of the leadership. And at that was the time when they uh, decided to form an organization. And in the process of forming an organization, they had to select a leader, a spokesperson, a president. And when Martin got to the meeting, he was a little late, and they were talking about the leadership, and they were discussing the fact that uh, who's, whoever named, whose ever name was, was projected, that that person might become a target. And I think then people began to sort of uh, resist the whole idea. And uh, when uh, E.D. Nixon proposed Martin's name, uh, you know, Martin said, well, um, you know, I'm not sure I'm the best person uh, for this position since I'm new in the community. And, uh, but if, uh, if no one else is going to serve, uh, you know, someone has to do it. And uh, I'd be glad to, I'd be glad to try to do it. And of course, uh, I guess everybody then assured him they wanted him. So he came home very excited uh, about the fact that he had to give the keynote speech that night at the mass meeting. He only had 20 minutes to prepare his speech. So uh, I was thinking to myself, uh, how wonderful it would be if I could get out of this house and go, but my baby was a few weeks old and my doctor said, you have to stay in for a whole month. You know, I didn't have any problems having the baby, but uh, to stay in a whole month, that was what was re re required uh, by my doctor. So I was going to be obedient. But uh, then uh, Martin went to his study and he made an outline as he very often did. And naturally he couldn't write a speech in 20 minutes that was so uh, fateful, really. I mean, the, that, that particular um, occasion was to determine the, the future, the destiny of that whole movement. And uh, I think he understood that because the boycott had been so effective all day. Uh, Martin said it had been 99 and 9 tenths percent, I believe, effective. And therefore, if people came out in large numbers that night, then we really had you know, a movement, and we had to find a way to continue it. And being the spokesman was a tre pretty tremendous job, an awesome job, really, and not even knowing where it was leading. Uh, so when he got there, he told me when he returned uh, that that there were so many people they couldn't get near the church. And they, when they got finally got up to the church, they almost had to be carried over the shoulders of people, he and Reverend Abernathy, in order to get to the pulpit. And of course, the excitement of the crowd uh, certainly generated great uh, enthusiasm and inspiration in Martin. And I, he made, I think, a very important speech that really uh, did determine which direction the movement would go, as well as the tone, I guess maybe more importantly, the tone of the movement. Uh, it was to be a nonviolent movement, and he called for Christian love and to uh, not retaliate with violence that uh, no matter what violence was perpetrated against us, that we must not retaliate, but that we must love our white brother and let him know that we love him, and that uh, we must continue to struggle in a determined manner so that uh, we would, uh, if we would do that and we would, you know, and do it, I mean, as he called for a kind of unity, that he felt that uh, future generations uh, would have to say that, uh, pause and say that there lived a people, a black people, a great people, who injected a new uh, uh, meaning into our civilization. And uh, this was an uh, you know, overwhelming challenge, a responsibility and a overwhelming challenge 
and our responsibility, I believe is what he said. Fortunately, I got someone to tape it. So we have a copy of the speech, uh, which we were able to use in the film, the documentary, Montgomery to Memphis, which really gave a very important beginning. Martin found himself in the leadership of a movement that was applying a technique that had been applied very uh, successfully in India, the uh, technique of nonviolence. And it was not uh, something that he had, he had thought it through to a large extent in terms of how nonviolence could be applied, but he had not thought through exactly I'm sure how he would do it in a particular situation. He went back and read books uh, on Gandhi and on, I'm sure he must have read, I think I heard him say Thoreau, and the things that he had studied in uh, college and uh, th uh, theological seminary and, and, and uh, also uh, in um, uh, his uh, studies for his doc doctoral degree. Uh, and all of that. But then I think he, his greatest source was from, I think, uh, the Bible and the teachings of, of Christ, because as a Christian minister, uh, he felt that uh, his understanding, of course, of nonviolence was that nonviolence was based on, on a certain principles that were the same principles that uh, as a Christian, uh, he had em embraced uh, love. Uh, the foundation of the Christian faith is, is love. And, and, uh, and of course, uh, truth uh, is another very important uh, tenet. And, uh, and he understood love in the unconditional sense. And he also understood, uh, you know, that the, in the life of Christ, um, he had demonstrated in his own life, uh, I think, an example of nonviolence and, and in terms of his ability uh, to not to become a part of an unjust system, to cooperate with it, but to uh, also, uh, you know, condemn it and to, as Christ's work, to change it. He said, I got my motivation from uh, Jesus, my motivation and inspiration from Jesus and my techniques from Gandhi. And when he was criticized about boycotting because you would put individuals out of business, the nonviolent philosopher says you don't focus on the individual but on the system. It was the system of segregation that had caused in individuals to behave unjustly. And so he said, I'm not trying to put anybody out of business. I'm just trying to put justice in business. And uh, when, you, when you understand that, that this is what you really have to do in order uh, to follow the nonviolent discipline, and which is, if it's followed, it becomes a transforming force as well for change. I mean, the actions of the individuals are, are effective, but you do it in the spirit of uh, recon love and reconciliation. You don't do it in a way that you're trying to, uh, to, uh, to really hurt the individual personality. Personality is sacred, and, uh, he, he, and it's to be respected, but it's the behavior that we wanted to change, and that is what he became to to understand. And I think at that point, then uh, uh, he felt much better about you know about his actions. But when it's raised in the media, when it's raised by individuals, you do have to think about it. And I think he grew in his uh, understanding and his ability to uh, I think articulate uh, the meaning of nonviolence and to translate nonviolence into a kind of action program because that's what Gandhi was able to do. The mass meetings uh, usually were attended by the maids and cooks and janitors and people who uh, 
really used the buses a lot and they would leave work and come to the church very early and they would start the prayer services. Um, I think people look forward to coming to the church uh, where they could just kind of, you know, in a sense, relax and fellowship and commune. And I think be renewed uh, and inspired. Uh, I think the prayers and the singing served as, as a um, kind of a therapeutic thing for, for them in terms of, of giving them the strength to, to continue uh, the next day. And as Christian people, they believe very much, uh, you know, in prayer and uh, the songs of, of the faith uh, uh, and all, and just just people coming together in, in uh, solidarity and having and sharing some of the same kinds of experiences. It helped them to go back out the next day uh, to face whatever insults that they were going to have to face. And when you think about some of those people who really uh, were, were working for people who, who really were very angry and who would talk about the leadership, and they'd have to listen to that and not say a word. I mean, they had to, and maybe some of them would listen and almost agree, knowing that they didn't agree. You know, it was because they, in those days, you you couldn't express your feelings if you were on that other end, you know, it, as a, uh, a person who worked for someone. Because they, very often, they'd been good to them in terms of helping them with their families, doing extra things. They didn't pay them very much, but they would do other things for them. And, and I think they loved them in a patronizing kind of way, you know, paternalistically. Uh, there were some genuine, genuine relationships, I'm sure. There were some. Then they would be there singing and praying for hours sometimes before the program actually started, the main part of the mass meeting. I think the mass meeting started around 7, uh, 7.30. And by the time the leadership got there, the clergy and all, and they started the main part of the program, uh, which was to discuss uh, where things were and whatever incidents that had taken place to keep them informed and then to give them strategy, direction on the strategies, the next, the next step and all of that. Uh, and because uh, people would wait to get the word, what's Dr. King's going to say? Dr. Abernathy would speak first, usually, and uh, he would, he had the ability to really um, make them laugh and maybe make them cry some. I mean, but because he would, he told jokes. He uh, he uh, he really knew how to, you know, kind of get them in the mood, so they could sit and listen to what Dr. King had to say. And uh, so the combination of uh, the two styles was very good, very helpful, I think. Uh, not that Reverend Abernathy was never serious, but he really had that ability uh, to kind of, you know, speak to people right where they uh, they were at the moment. And I, it, I guess you'd call it kind of folksy quality. Uh, he was able to do that because that was a part of his style. Whereas with Martin, he was more... Um, I guess um, what you would consider uh, formal, and uh, uh, he uh, would come along with, with a very thoughtful uh, message, a very analytical message, uh, his main message usually was. And then uh, as a preacher, I mean, he got emotional and involved in his message. But by the time he got to that point, I mean, they had listened and they had understood what he was talking about. And uh, with the sincerity that he had, uh, you know, and his great uh, oratory and his charisma and all of that, and he moved people, uh, he persuaded them, uh, you know, when he talked to them about the meaning of, of not, of, of being willing to absorb the suffering and even the physical blows without retaliating and what this would mean in terms of of uh, the kind of being a, a kind of redeeming force for change and that 
making them feel very good about what they were doing and that they were making a contribution just by being there, by putting their body, so to speak, on the line, by being a part of the protest and to being identified with it. Uh, he also helped them to understand that maybe there were some people who could not be there uh, because uh, they, uh, they played a different role. But if those people gave funds and supported, maybe not everyone has to be here physically and be seen. Because if you work for the state in those days, or you were a teacher, uh, you may not be able to uh, come to a mass meeting and, and keep your job. What happened throughout the mass meeting is that there were songs interspersed. Uh, they had an order of service, and so they would... What would happen when they would come and sing without, without an instrument at all? Uh, sometimes they would do what you call the long meter and uh, the, with the hymns of, of the church and so on, it was that they would have someone who played the piano, the organ, and they would start, you know, just like they started the church services, really. And they would sing the songs and hymns of the church. What a friend we have in Jesus. Uh, what a fellowship. Uh, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arm. Uh, they may sing, oh, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, which is a spiritual. Uh, and uh, they would, uh, uh, for a long, I think throughout Montgomery and into maybe as far as into Albany, I, they, there was not a, a use of what we call freedom song. They would do the spiritual, oh, freedom over me, freedom before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. And or they would sing, go down Moses, way down in Egypt's land. But aside from that, uh, these were spirituals. They were mostly things that they knew. And it was later, as I said, that uh, the, uh, the spirituals were taken and they substituted words uh, and uh, made them more relevant to what we were doing. They would end, of course, after Martin's message with, with a, a song and a prayer, benediction and prayer. And uh, everybody would go home you know, feeling, uh, you know, good and inspired and uh, ready to go back the next morning uh, to a long day of, well, you know what, uh, work, hard work. But they, I think they could take it a little bit better, really. Even the work that they, that had been difficult became easier. It was something about that experience that gave you all, gave all of us uh, so much, uh, so much hope and and inspiration, and as the more we got into it, the more we we had the feeling that something could be done about the situation, that we could change it. Well, I, I still think he said it that way. There were moments when he was, uh, you know, he was not. He didn't know quite which uh, way to go and what quite what to do next. And uh, you know, th th there are these moments when you when you're not sure what is going to happen and what is the best strategy to use. I think there were times in the early struggle, but what they did was to um, sit down together and they would they would plan and they would come up with a, a way around the situation. I think with the times when it looked as if they were going to try to uh, enjoin the carpool through the courts uh, to, stop, to stop them, or when they were rounding up all the leadership and arresting them, uh, there's always a concern if you take all the leaders to jail, who's going to lead? And uh, Martin did not like to go to jail first, he would let others go. And then when they were doing a, a, a campaign that was extended, and then he would go toward the end because he needed to, to, to stay there to keep the momentum going and to generate uh, support, you know, around the country. And this was later on. Martin had talked about uh, the necess necessity to go to jail. Uh, for what we believed in, for what they believed in, for the righteous cause, and he kept saying, "Our cause is just. We are, we are 
moving uh, on the side of God, that God is with us in our struggle, and we are right. And I think people felt that there was a rightness, and he said uh, it, it means it means suffering and sacrifice and going to jail. And we will go to jail proudly, and we will transform these dungeons of shame into a haven of freedom and justice. I mean, you know, he had a way of turning words and phrases that, you know, would, would inspire people. And so that most people went to jail gladly and willingly. They were, you know, going to jail for my freedom is uh, quite different from going to jail because I've committed a crime, because I think they always knew that it was not a crime. Their only crime was that they wanted freedom, and that was a great uh, way in which to express it by going to jail as a protest against it, so that you uh, inspire many others and that you do something about uh, changing that system uh, as you continue to fill the jails, because he really encouraged them to fill the jails. I think it was a an evolution uh, that we were all experiencing because um, I was very much involved as an activist in college. So that when Montgomery started, uh, you know, I was very excited about all this because my only really regret was that I could not be there all the time when the action was taking place, but I was there in spirit. The uh, movement started spontaneously, and our home became the uh, place where everybody met, where it was a gathering place. It was uh, The focus was really right there in the parsonage where the leadership came so much of the time to meet. And so I was able to keep abreast of everything, too, and I watched the news. A lot of my husband's interviews were held at the house. Most of the people who visited Montgomery, and there were people who started coming from all around the world very quickly. Uh, the news spread fast, you know, 50,000 people. This had never happened anywhere where 50,000 black people stood up in solidarity and, and, and were boycotting the buses, and uh, it was working. So that was a, quite a phenomenon, and it attracted attention as far away as South Africa. Because in that year, it was reported by the press that there was a boycott in Johannesburg, South Africa. There was one in uh, Tallahassee, Florida, one in Mobile that the Reverend Lowry led, and one in uh, Birmingham that Fred Shuttlesworth, and of course C.K. Steele in Tallahassee. And in Atlanta later, uh, Reverend William Holmes Borders led the one in Atlanta. So there were all these movements springing up right after Montgomery during the year 56. Uh, and people from the north were so excited and they were coming. I mean, people were coming from all over just to, to talk, to be with people, to see what they could do to give encouragement. If they were white, it was more difficult for them to be visible, but they would give support. But blacks were you know, offering support and wanting to be a part of. And naturally, they didn't live there, so boycotting the buses, it was difficult for them to, uh, to uh, help very much with that, except by not patronizing. But with morale and things, they would come and visit the meetings. And just to have these people coming in and, and, and telling us how proud they were and how, how they felt uh, you know, more like human beings because somewhere people were standing up for, for freedom and, and they know that they would win. And, you know, things of this kind really encouraged us to continue. Now, when Martin first was arrested was uh, for a traffic violation, which they, uh, it was a rather trumped up charge. And that was in January of 1956, uh, early. Uh, uh, and, 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 and that was going alone. You know, he did go alone. I mean, that was not planned. There were times when he went to jail when it wasn't planned. But when they planned to go to jail, that's when, you know, people were prepared because a part of the process of nonviolence is preparation. Well, I think it was his, uh, his um, first of all, his understanding of uh, his, the Christian uh, um, faith, what it means to be truly Christian, because we are taught 
that we should uh, not hate, we should love even our enemies. We're taught that uh, that we must forgive, I mean, and we must uh, do it many, many times, not just one time. Um, I think there's one passage that says 70 times seven. And, and so Martin was understanding that, uh, uh, you know, if he was true to his commitment to the Christian ministry, that he had a responsibility to fight for uh, the liberation of his people because Christianity is a liberating religion. I knew that uh, this was uh, the beginning of uh, many struggles, but I thought that the fact that we were successful and um, desegregating the buses and that this led to not only Montgomery buses being desegregated, but it would it was a uh, an action that would cause the desegregation of transportation uh, anywhere where it was segregated. And we knew that once we broke the barrier, that it would be easier for other areas of uh, segregation to be uh, eliminated. And we knew that we would have to go on. At first, we didn't even ask for desegregation. We only asked for a, a more humane system of segregation in, on the buses. And when the opposition refused to grant that, then we realized that they wouldn't grant anything uh, anyway. So we might as well ask for you know, complete desegregation. And uh, that's what we went for, and we realized we had to go for broke, so to speak. So uh, the the fact that people were able to stick together for that length of time, and that there was a favorable ruling from the courts on this, it meant that the courts, the climate was created around which the courts could act. And we realized that what we had to do was to take each situation, uh, you know, separately and continue to work on it until uh, we had achieved that uh, desegregation of public accommodations and in the right to vote and so on. We didn't actually have a celebration of that kind. Um, Martin helped the, the um, following to understand that you, when you have a, a victory or when you're you achieve the goal that you've set, that you don't, um, you take it humbly. You know, he, he said, when we go back to the buses, we're not going to go back bragging about the fact that, you know, we won, but that uh, we go back and we try to win friends with those people, you know, who were not friendly with us before, because part of the process of nonviolence is to achieve a reconciliation when, when the struggle has been won. And uh, if you do it nonviolently, it is uh, it is uh, more it, it is easier to to have that that kind of of uh, reconciliation take place. But if it's violent, then it's almost impossible. And so, where we had a great sense of fulfillment uh, in what we had done, and Montgomery itself was a period in my life that. I just, I feel, I felt so much uh, fulfillment. It was a realization of a lot of things in terms of where I should be, uh, what I should be doing with my own life. Uh, I came to realize that that I was supposed to be involved and to be there. That uh, when I made the decision uh, to mar marry Martin, that that was. The decision that would determine my destiny. I knew that, but then I, it was like having a realization and a moment of truth in the situation that, uh, that reaffirmed the feeling that I had that perhaps uh, this would lead to, uh, when I made the decision, that it would lead to uh, uh, a, a different kind of life and that there was a destiny involved. So this was sort of like, yeah, there had to be, because this kind of a thing could never just happen. Uh, not in Montgomery, Alabama. Not, you know, here's a young man who not had any experience, but all of a sudden 
he emerges as the leader and the spokesperson and a great hero of the people, a great symbol of the aspirations and hopes of, of millions of people by that time. Jump your head a little bit. <clears throat> Well, I was expecting uh, my third child, which uh, was uh, who's Dexter, who's now 24, almost 25. And um, I guess when you're uh, pregnant, you, you feel more insecure with your husband being away. Um, and being... A, in jail for any length of time is always a problem. Martin had decided earlier on in Montgomery that he would not bail himself out of jail whenever he went. Uh, he would uh, stay there and 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 uh, as a part of of the protest or part of the the nonviolent strategy to to stay in jail until something had changed. Uh, in terms of granting uh, part of what, what what was being asked or what have you. In the early days, everybody uh, was arrested and got out of jail. But but what 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 I I think happened when we came to uh, Atlanta and was arrested at Riches is that he had already decided he would not accept bail unless something happened in the situation that had improved it. And so when he, I knew he was going to stay in jail, then, uh, and I was expecting, uh, it just created a lot more of a hardship because I wanted to visit with him because I know he really didn't like to go to jail. He used to say, anyone who has any sense does not like to go to jail all the time. He said, but I go to jail because I must. And, uh, and uh, he felt it was necessary for someone to do it. And if that was his role and the price he had to pay to free some people, he would be willing to do that. So as I was expecting and having to go back and forth to jail, you know, it was very tiring and wearying. But I expected Martin to come out of jail when everybody else came out once there was a settlement reached. And I found out when the rest of them left, uh, they let them out and there was some settlement made between the department store and the business community and all and 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 the student and the leadership of the movement they kept martin and we didn't understand why and it took a while for me to find out why martin couldn't come out of jail and being uh, pregnant as i was i was very immediately depressed because i had expected to see him and when they said he had to be taken to DeKalb County, because this is Fulton County in Atlanta where he was, uh, then I didn't understand what was going to happen. And then finally I found out it was about a traffic charge uh, that, had, uh, that had been made earlier. And that uh, the judge had discretionary powers even. And that really disturbed me. But we went to court and we had good lawyers in DeKalb County. And we thought that he was going to have to, he would come out soon. But the judge, after the hearing, said, I, f I find the defendant guilty and sentence him to six months hard labor in the Reedsville State Penitentiary. And I wasn't expecting it. And it was just like a, you know, almost like a bombshell. And the students were very upset, and my sister-in-law was upset, and we were all feeling so tense. I was very depressed about Martin being in jail and being so far away, and knowing I couldn't get to see him um, in less than a whole day's journey and back. And, and suddenly I got this very unexpected but uplifting uh, telephone call from Senator John F. Kennedy. And he was campaigning and was at O'Hare Airport and called and said, hello, Mrs. King, this is Senator Kennedy. And I'm calling because I wanted to let you know I was thinking about you. How are you? I understand you are expecting your third child. I was amazed that you know, he even said third child. Someone, of course, had to tell him. But anyway, it was a very personal touch. 
And uh, he said, I'm thinking about you and your husband, and I know this must be very difficult for you. If there's anything I can do to be of help, I want you to please feel free to call on me. And I didn't quite know what to say except to thank him and say, well, I really appreciate this. And if there is anything that you can do, I would uh, deeply appreciate it. And uh, of course, uh, knowing the uh, implications of all of this, he he was it was toward the, uh, the end of the the month of October, and the election was just a few days away, uh, the presidential election, and I didn't quite know what to make of it. Very shortly afterward, uh, a reporter called and said, I understand the uh, Senator Kennedy called you. Uh, uh, what did he say? <laughs> and I said, well, uh, um, uh, why don't you ask him? I said, <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I really don't feel free to tell you. Why don't you ask him? So anyway, my father-in-law and I were on our way to see a lawyer because we were trying to figure out a way to get Martin out of jail legally, because we knew the judge had discretionary powers and the only legal recourse was probably through the Board of Corrections. In the meantime, uh, I called, when I returned from this visit to the lawyer, I returned, I, I, I made a call to Senator Kennedy's campaign and spoke to a person that I knew, Harris Warford, who was working with Senator Kennedy. And I told him about this call and asked him, his advice. He said, oh, tell them. He said, there were a lot of reporters around and there, and there were, you know, some of the human rights people. And so it's all right. You just tell them what happened. <laughs> so then I started receiving more phone calls. And of course I did report it, but that call was a very important call. I think it, it, it did turn the tide because Martin was released from jail. And I guess, uh, and about uh, and the next day, actually, the next day, this was on the day that he had been taken to Reedsville, that I got the call, and the next day he was released, late in the day. And um, then we went to a mass meeting that night, as we usually did, to go to our churches to have a meeting. And Daddy King said, um, you know, this was the first time we'd had a Catholic to run for president. And most black people were like most other Americans about Catholics, I guess. But we were not sure about Nixon, but Nixon had befriended a lot of people. And so Daddy King said, I have a sack full of votes, and I'm going to take them to the White House and place them at Senator Kennedy's feet. And of course, essentially what he was saying that is he was going to vote for him. And actually, I think the difference in that election, which is very close, uh, had to do with Martin's, uh, his intercession in Martin's case, uh, because Senator Kennedy won by a very narrow margin of less than 100,000 votes. Well, I don't think that, I mean, I, 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 I just talk, I mean, I'm not speaking about what Reverend Walker said, I'm speaking about what I understood of Albany and what I think the difficulty was in Albany. Um, and I think Albany is perhaps one of the least understood of the campaigns. We were dealing with a more humane police force, number one, law enforcement body. And they, uh, they did what they were supposed to do. When you break the law, what do you expect? You expect to get arrested, go to jail. Uh, in in other communities, they were more brutal, they were more inhumane, and there were confrontations. And very often, it was the confrontations that caused people to pay attention to what was going on. Uh, in Albany, we had a federal injunction placed against us. And uh, when the federal court started ruling against us, that created a whole different thing in terms of what strategy do you use now? Because up to that point, Martin had been uh, willing to break state laws that were unjust laws. And our ally was the federal um, judiciary. And so if we would take our case to the federal court and the federal court ruled against us, what recourse did we have? 
So we were working in concert with the uh, federal laws all the time in the South up to that point. But so what we he was asking Senator Kennedy, I mean President Kennedy and uh, the Attorney General Bobby Kennedy for an intercession in Albany that that they needed he needed some intercession. He was asking them the Justice Department to intercede as a friend of the court so that that injunction could be lifted. Because if you break the federal injunction, that would be a problem. And that was essentially the problem in Albany. Uh, naturally, you would be frustrated if you were pleading to the federal government who was friendly and they did not act. You see, it's, un it's important to understand this, and I have to go further for people to understand what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that in Birmingham, for instance, he made the decision that he would break the injunction. But he had a situation in Birmingham with the brutality that caused the nation to rise up against that. So he had, uh, you know, sort of a more moral authority in Birmingham because of the reaction of the opposition. For instance, in Birmingham, we had a federal injunction. And see, and it, it began to be a strategy of the opposition to stop the movement. And they started in Albany, and it caught us off guard. So in Birmingham, when the federal injunction was placed, Albany had become a learning ground. And Martin had decided that he was going to go against that federal injunction and go on to jail and take that risk at whatever, come whatever. But we had in Birmingham a different situation. We had a more uh, inhumane and brutal police force uh, and what they were able to do was to arouse the conscience of the nation in support of the demonstrators because they brought out the fire hoses and the dogs and all of that. And because of that, Martin began to, to have the moral authority on his side, and he went to jail in, in Birmingham despite the fact that it was a federal injunction. He broke it. The fact is that he had to serve time even in 1967, as late as December 1967, he had to go back to Birmingham and serve five days because of that, uh, that he broke that law. He went willingly, but the fact is that if people don't understand that, they, they, they talk about all other kinds of reasons why Albany didn't work. Albany didn't work because it was a new tactic that had come in. I'm not sure the opposition even realized it fully, but Martin began to realize it because he kept hoping and pleading to, to uh, uh, Burke Marshall. I heard him on the telephone saying, we need uh, some help down here. You know, he said, we've got to have some of a victory in order to keep, uh, you know, people uh, in the movement inspired. And, and, uh, and so the only thing they could do then was to we would try to fill up the jails. When we all decided to go to jail and the wives were going to lead the march, I was going to lead it along with Gene Young and Juanita Abernathy and others, they decided to let Martin and Ralph out of jail. And that sort of took the steam out of what we were doing. I mean, they were very clever. And the others were not as smart as that in many of the other places. Birmingham was um, very difficult for many reasons. Um, from a personal standpoint, basically, um, I was in a situation with four children. Martin was uh, in jail. Uh, I did not even have uh, regular household help. I had temporary volunteer help, and four children, and my husband in jail. And it was it was really a, a problem here in Atlanta because in Montgomery I had. We had gone through a struggle together, and even though this was home, people didn't react the same way. It was, everybody was preoccupied with Montgomery. I mean, it was, it was a way of life. I mean, for a whole year, we uh, boycotted more than a year, the buses before the desegregation took place. So in, in, in Montgomery, here we were uh, in a situation soon after we arrived, and uh, there was uh, not much help coming forth from people just, we had a volunteer church member to help. And that was difficult for me. 
Uh, the difficulty of understanding what was going to happen, I knew that. I was prepared for Birmingham. I was prepared for that because we had waited for the baby to come and so Mar Martin could go to jail in Birmingham. Birmingham was the best planned campaign we had ever had. And so it worked very well because it was planned quite well. Although the sit situation in Birmingham uh, and the... Um, Segregation there was was so uh, uh, intense. Martin felt that uh, it was the most segregated city, uh, second to Johannesburg, South Africa, in the world, and uh, he understood that it was going to be the opposition was going to be tough there. But we were prepared for that. But he wanted to fill the jails, and that's what happened. But what really bothered me most was when he went to jail on Good Friday, they did not allow him to uh, make a phone call. And I always got a phone call from him once he went to jail, so I felt better hearing from him. Friday passed, Saturday, Sunday, no call. And that's when I called Wyatt Walk on Easter Sunday and asked him uh, if uh, he thought it would help if I made a statement to the press on uh, the way they were being treated. They were being held incommunicado and uh, to say that I was concerned about his safety because when you don't hear from people, you don't even know what's going on in jail. and. Wyatt said, I don't, I think what you should do is to call the president. And I said, you think he talked to me? He said, of course, he'd have to. And so I said, well, okay, uh, I guess I'll do that. But, I, but could you uh, send a note in to Martin, see if you can get a note in and ask him, tell him what we're trying to do and get his, his opinion on it. Because I wouldn't want to do anything to interfere, you know, and he tried all day long, and about tonight he called, and he said, they're not even letting the lawyers in now. And he said, you don't, I don't think you have any choice now but to call. So I proceeded to call, and finally, uh, you know, I got no response because I didn't know how to do it. Finally, I said to the operator, she kept saying, we have no listing for the president, anyone, his family, not for the vice president. And I said, there must be someone who can get me to the president. And she says, what about Pierre Salinger? And I said, oh, sure. I don't know why I didn't think about that. And Pierre Salinger was right there on the phone when she uh, called, uh, placed a call. And he said, oh, sure, Mrs. King, uh, I'll tell the president. I said I wanted to see him. I wanted to talk to him, rather. Uh, well, the president uh, didn't call right away, but Bobby Kennedy called the Attorney General that evening. And he uh, wanted to know what he could do to help. And he complained about the situation in Birmingham and officials and how difficult it was, but it would be better after the election took place. But they were going to be uh, sending the FBI in and, and uh, that uh, they would check on my husband and so on. Well, the next day, about 6 o'clock, uh, I got this call from uh, President Kennedy. And uh, when I got the call, of course, I did not realize he was on the phone because for, the call was answered downstairs by my housekeeper. So I got a call and the call came in downstairs. And when I came onto the call, the operator was saying, will you get your child off the phone, please? And so little Dexter was there babbling away on the phone. And, and I yelled down to say, get Dexter off the phone. And then this voice came on and I knew it was a familiar voice. And he said, Mrs. King, uh, I, um, how are you? I, um, got your message you know i understand you talked to my brother and uh, he uh, did he explain to you we sent uh, the fbi in last night to check on your husband and he he is all right uh i want you to know that uh that we are doing everything we can and uh dr king is is, is safe and and if there's anything that i can do uh, in the next few days to be of help, feel free to call them. You know how to get me, don't you? Uh, you get in touch with me or my brother or Pierre. Uh, you know how to get me, don't you? And I said, yes, Mr. President, thank you so much. He said, and by the way, your husband will be calling you very shortly. And it was such a relief. In about 15 minutes, Martin called. And, of course, he fasted when he went to jail, and he was really kept that, you know, you could tell he was very kind of down with no energy, and when he spoke, of course, uh, he was very glad to speak to me, but he didn't know why he was calling. And of course, I tried to 
convey it to him without saying every word because we knew we were being wiretapped. And uh, so he got sent back to me to get the message through to Wyatt Walker and, you know, get the press. You know, we had to use the press to keep to get the word out. And uh, Martin said after that, uh, they were, as a matter of fact, they had been sleeping on steel. They gave them mattresses and pillows and got them out for exercise and showers and so forth. I mean, the treatment changed markedly, and it was because of that intervention. Um, well, you know, after that, I felt much better, and of course, I was able to go and visit Martin uh, uh, that week, and uh, and of course, I felt better after I knew he was in communication, uh, that someone could reach him as long as he was safe. I didn't worry about what he was doing because I supported it and I believed I knew it had to be done. And he very much wanted to do this, to identify with the life, the life of Christ going to jail on Good Friday. And it was a very, very emotional thing with the staff, I understand, when he was trying to make his decision. Because if he went to jail, broke the injunction, uh, what would happen if the movement stopped or if it continued or how? You know, all that he had to make a decision on. He was trying to get Ralph to go with him. Ralph said, I need to be in my pulpit. Easter Sunday, you have Daddy King and you don't have to be there. And he said, Ralph, you've always been with me, but I'm going. And Ralph joined him. Well, I was shocked, really, because it was right after the March on Washington in 1963, which was such a great experience. It was a great moment of fulfillment uh, when Martin gave his I Have a Dream speech, and we really felt the sense of progress that people came together, black and white, even though the South was totally segregated, but here black and white people were there together. And we felt that, felt that sense of oneness, and, and uh, we, we just, you know, had the feeling that, you know, the dream could be realized. And then a few weeks later, this bombing in Birmingham with four innocent little girls. And then you realized how intense uh, this whole feeling was and the opposition was, and that it would take a lot more than what was being done to change the situation. Um, in a sense, it was it was just one of those things. What could you say? I mean, these are innocent children in a Sunday school. I mean, you know, the person you think about the the, the human being that did this. Uh, but I think it was those young girls were martyrs were martyrs for the cause. And whenever you have martyrs, it tends to it advances the cause. I think that in Birmingham, in this Birmingham story and, and, and the achievement of the settlement that led to the Civil Rights Act, John F. Kennedy, too, became a martyr because in the fall, uh, November, as a matter of fact, 22nd, he was assassinated in that same year. And with the four little girls and John F. Kennedy, um, President Johnson uh, was able to get the Civil Rights Act passed, I think, in 1964 in July because it became a memorial to, to President Kennedy. I understand that was part of the technique that was used to get the uh, uh, bill through the Congress. When I arrived at, in Selma and went to the church where the meeting was being held, it was a noontime mass meeting, Andy Young said to me, Malcolm L. X is here. And he just made a speech, and he has really aroused the people. And you're going to have to speak, because you're going to have to uh, really talk about nonviolence and sort of invoke, you know, the whole nonviolent spirit, because uh, the people now are in turn a different way. And I said, Andy, I don't feel like speaking. I really don't want to speak. He said, but you're going to have to speak. And I was there to visit Martin who was in jail, really. And uh, so he finally kept uh, saying, well, you know, you really got to do it and I, I, we just need it. So I said, well, okay, for the cause, you know, I'll do it. Because I wasn't that inspired myself. Well, you know, when you get into a situation with an audience and people who have that spirit, you know, you kind of get some spirit yourself. And as I was sitting on the platform, Malcolm X leaned over toward me 
because we sat next to each other. And he said, uh, Mrs. King, will you tell Dr. King that I'm sorry I won't get to see him. I had planned to visit him uh, in jail. Uh, but I have to leave. I have to go out of the country uh, to, uh, I believe he said France or England, to an All Africa conference. But I want him to know, do you tell him that I, that, that I, I didn't come to make his job more difficult? Uh, I thought that if the white people understood what the alternative was, that they would be willing to listen to Dr. King. Well, I didn't quite know how to take it because prior to that, I had my own perception of Malcolm and I, you know, I, I thought of him as being a really violent type person. I mean, you know, but he was so meek and he was, he was so different, you know, as most people are when you get to know them. Uh, when you confront them. And uh, so I said, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be sure and tell him. And of course, within a few weeks, uh, Malcolm had been assassinated. And uh, it made a tremendous impact on me because I kept thinking, what a, what a waste. Okay. He, had, he had begun to turn around after having gone to Mecca and understanding what true Islam is. Whenever there was violence of any kind, it was depressing to Martin because he understood the potential of, of, of destroying community, destroying life, an unnecessary life if it is not controlled and if it's not stopped really. And what he wanted to do is to try to find it, way to turn this into to a nonviolent struggle. Struggle had to be, but it must be nonviolent. The violence came from the opposition. But uh, when I talked to him that evening, and I was out in San Francisco when, I, when, he, when he called, I called him, and he seemed so depressed, I said to him, and I was trying to think of something to cheer him, uh, that uh, if you have all those people to come in, as he was uh, mobilizing people to come in, I think it was for Tuesday, and this was Sunday night, uh, then uh, you can, uh, you know, write your own law, so to speak. There was an injunction uh, against marching, same kind of thing that we tried in Birmingham. And uh, we had... Uh, the people already haven't been hurt and so on, and it was just dangerous to try to do this unless we could get the federal, the National Guard federalized. And this is what he was asking uh, the president to do, to federalize the National Guard. The troops were already there, and they were the Alabama National Guard. And what he wanted to do was to federalize them. And so that's uh, what he was hoping and asking for. Uh, but. It was a very difficult time for him and for, for me too because I felt torn. Well, since I wasn't, I wasn't in Atlanta and I wanted to rush back. I was out west uh, trying to raise money through my Freedom Concert performances. And, uh, and I said to Martin, I'll come back. He said, no, you don't need to come back. You stay because you're making a contribution too. But I knew what I would do if uh, anything happened. I was going to take that first plane out. But fortunately, I didn't have to do that. Uh, but but Selma was, um, in many ways, very uh, rewarding, but in many ways, very frustrating, too. I was alone in my bedroom when President Johnson gave that speech, the We Shall Overcome speech is what we call it. And I was talking to the television, I kept saying, they finally got the message. They finally got the message. And I was thinking, oh, this is great. This is great. Then he would say, we shall overcome, and we shall overcome. And I just, you know, I had nobody to talk to because I was alone. The kids was, I think the kids might have been asleep. But, you know, here I was in my bedroom just feeling such great thrill, you know, to have the president, you know, saying these things 
which I thought the whole nation would somehow begin to feel. And I think uh, that uh, did happen. Uh, that was a great moment. Well, I wasn't with him, so I really don't know. He was not in, in Atlanta, so I really, I really don't know he could have. He cried occasionally. <laughs> uh, you know, you cry with, uh, with moments of fulfillment and joy, and you cry in moments of sadness, and sometimes you cry when you just, you know, have so much pressure and you've got to release it, you know. <laughs> It was a great moment to go back to Montgomery because, you see, for us, it was returning to Montgomery after 10 years. And I kept thinking about 10 years earlier, how we were visibly just blacks. And when you looked at that march, you had Catholic priests and nuns and you had other clergy and you had a lot of white people. I mean, you know, it was really a beautiful thing to pass Dexter Avenue and pass and go toward the Capitol, uh, marching together, uh, even though it was a dangerous march. I mean, we never, never felt that we were safe at any point, even coming into Montgomery that day, into the city, because they had uh, guard, national, federal uh, guardsmen on buildings and all around. And as we came through certain sections, the staff people surrounded Martin and uh, even held up their hands around his head to make sure that if there was a, a bullet that, you know, it would be deflected. So, I mean, it was not easy and there were threats of uh, plots for his assassination all the way through that march. So, you know, though when we got down to Dexter and going up toward the Capitol, it was safer. Uh, and there was a great feeling of exhilaration uh, when you look back and saw, you know, what we thought was 50,000 at least, and a lot of entertainment, personalities, and so on. It was a, a great moment of fulfillment having done that and listening to Martin's speech uh, that day. And he ended it with uh, the um, um, Glory Hallelujah, which was, uh, you know, used at the last speech he made. But he had asked me to write out the words to that, My eyes have seen the glory, and certain verses that he didn't remember. Uh, and he ended his speech that day with that uh, same, uh, quoting that same uh, song. I think the sense of dignity that black people had uh, achieved and the feeling that uh, they had now a place in our society in a, and they could be represented because they had not yet uh, registered the large number of people, but at least we had the ballot had been achieved, desegregation of public transportation, uh, desegregate, desegregation of public accommodations. Uh, and of course, we had, uh, in a sense, we had uh, desegregated uh, the, uh, the, South, in, in, essentially, in terms of the barriers physically that separated us. But the implementation of all of this had yet to be realized. The, uh, there was also the lack of uh, economic uh, progress. I mean, with, with the barriers of segregation being uh, eliminated, so to speak, legally, all the legal barriers were... Uh, had been uh, eliminated, but there were these other barriers that would would uh, still keep people in a in a form of of, of uh, oppression uh, and uh, to a disadvantage unless something took place there. So Martin knew that at some point he had to deal with that. But we were confronted with a war, the Vietnam War, so he had to deal with that issue, and uh, he spoke out, of course on the Vietnam War, and then because of the reaction, he sort of uh, retreated a bit because people were not ready to continue to support him in that and support civil rights. But then, of course, in 1967, he began his campaign for economic justice, and that is what he uh, understood was the final and great challenge 
and that it would require uh, much more from from uh, from all of us. And he said, this is going to be the most d difficult uh, aspect of our whole struggle.